All right. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, those who are uh, joining us at home. Um, it's so good to see people here. <laughs> it makes my heart happy. Uh, would you guys stand and uh, join me in prayer before we get started in worship? Uh, Lord God, we're just so thankful, Lord, for your uh, provision, God, and for your faithfulness. And just to, uh, to gather as a body again, Lord, we just pray that... Uh, you'd be here in our midst tonight, God, that you would just uh, soften our hearts, that you would quiet us to go before your throne t tonight, Lord, just to, to seek your face. God, we're so uh, grateful and thankful for you, and we just want to give back and, and praise, Lord, everything that we have, Lord. We just pray that you would just, uh, Lord, continue to give us peace, Lord, continue to give us strength, Lord, as we go before you tonight. God, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to for I am not a captive to the lies And I'm not afraid to leave my past behind No, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Sing, there's power. There's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out a grave. There's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name. Power in your name. There's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out a grave. There's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name. Power in your name. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Sing it again. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your
sing our praises to you, Lord. We're so uh, in awe of your presence, God, and in awe of who you are, Lord. And we just pray, God, as we continue to live our lives, God, as we continue to seek you, that you would just continue to reveal yourself to us, God, to make yourself known in our lives, God. Open our eyes to see you in every circumstance of, 
of every minute of every day that we walk through, Lord, just that we'd be able to see the good, God, to see you. Lord, we just pray, Lord, that you would turn our hearts from just always wanting to see bad, always seeing the negative, Lord, always seeing the fear, always being discontent, Lord, but pray that you would turn our hearts to uh, to you, God, being content in all that you are for us, God, being content in, in everything that you have for us, Lord, because that's good enough, God. You are good enough. You're more than enough for us, Lord. God, we hunger for you, and we just pray that you would satisfy our hunger, Lord, satisfy our thirst here in this place tonight, Lord. We love you, and we give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. and change it. Chapter 19, you have fired pottery. The pottery is baked. Um, And so at that point, you have judgment. And at chapter 20, you have man's response to God's word. So here's God making his his statement to the people. And uh, in 18, he's calling them to repentance. In 19, he's saying the time for repentance has passed. Judgment has come. In 20, you have man's Continued rebellion and response against uh, God's um, prophet. So we want to look at those three together. Tonight we're going to look at chapter 19 and see what the Lord has for us there. So as we look at this section in, in Jeremiah, I just want you to keep you know, that, that kind of overview uh, set in your mind. In this section of Jeremiah, all the way till we get to chapter 25... This is a section of Jeremiah's prophecies and his writings that are focused on God explaining to and uh, through Jeremiah what's going on. So Jeremiah's got a lot of questions. God, what are you doing? What's happening? How does this all work? And so God's explaining those things to him. And so through Jeremiah, we get to experience uh, that understanding as well. And hopefully tonight that will... Uh, uh, open up a lot of our eyes, at least in terms of what does it mean, especially when we talk about ideas like God's judgment or God's wrath, because our picture as human beings of wrath or judgment is angry, you know, like we do. Like if my, if my judgment comes out, usually it's uh, the cork came out of the bottle and now the fizz is going everywhere and everybody's getting sticky and, and that's how we view wrath, you know, some kind of explosion. But that's not God's wrath. God's wrath is never like that. So he describes it as fire. He describes it as the, the, this, uh, um, this judgment, but it's a, it is a predisposed position. And that's, that's, sometimes that's what people don't understand. So, so we'll look at that tonight. So let's jump in. Jeremiah chapter 19, he's, he's going to begin by talking about uh, the, the next part of the... Uh, uh, act, the, the prophetic act that, uh, that Jeremiah is to do. So we look. Verse 1 says, Thus says the Lord, Go buy a potter's earthenware flask, and take some of the elders of the people and some of the elders of the priests, and go out to the valley of the son of Hinnom at the entry to the potsherd gate, and proclaim there the words that I tell you. So he says, look, I want you to go get finished pottery. Before we were looking at the potter making the pot, Right? Now he says, go buy a finished, a finished piece of pottery, a, a jar of clay. Go buy a jar of clay and 
gather together the elders and you're going to go out to a place called the, the Valley of the Son of Hinnom. The Valley of the Son of Hinnom has already been talked about twice in Jeremiah, chapter 2, chapter 7. It has been referred to scripturally. It is the place that Jesus pointed. There's a lot of overlay, so let's look at it. It's a place that Jesus pointed to and called Gehenna. Gehenna is one of the words we, we use to describe hell. So the Valley of the Son of Hinnom was a place that Jesus pointed at as hell. It was the dump. It was a place where they burned garbage. It was also the place where they sacrificed their children. It was also the place where the potter threw away the clay, his broken pots that he had made that he fired and they cracked and he couldn't use them, so they would throw it out the potsherd gate. So there would be a gate. If you go to Israel today, one of the ways they date the archaeological sites is by the pottery. You literally can almost walk into any field, anywhere in Jerusalem, reach down and pick up a piece of pottery. So that, that is long, <laughs> exists long before you were thought of. So when, one of the sites we were at, the, the folks this last trip we took to Israel, walking around picking up pottery and bringing it. Our guide was, a, was an archaeological student, and he would give them dates. And, uh, you know, when you're holding something in your hand that's 1,000 years old, that's a trip. I just picked this up off the ground. It's a wild place. So the idea, outside the, the potsherd gate where the potter threw away his stuff, in the valley where they had practiced in their history child sacrifice, in the area that Jesus would point at and describe as hell, the place where the, the worm never dies and the fires are never quenched, right? Jesus talked about Gehenna, which means the Valley of Hinnom. And <clears throat> also... Um, you know, Scripture lays out for us some, some of the practices that were a part of, of what was going on there. One of the other things we want to overlay is, you'll remember, Judas, when he uh, betrayed Christ, he went back to the priest. You remember the story? And he didn't want the, how much did they pay him? You remember? 30 pieces of silver, right? So he took the 30 pieces of silver and they said, hey, that doesn't have nothing to do with us. Uh, you took it. It's your money. So what did he do? He threw it. You remember? He cast it down into the temple, and he said, I don't want, this is blood money. And the priests say, this is blood money. What are we going to do with it? Do you remember what they did? They bought the potter's field, the place where they broke all the, threw away all the broken pottery, and they made it a tomb for the poor, right? Want to guess what valley that's in? Valley of the son of Hinnom all in the same area outside Jerusalem. So you have all of these overlays, right, about this area that, that we're talking about. So this section is, <coughs> again, mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 2, Jeremiah chapter 7. It's always talked, also talked about in Deuteronomy. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 12, is, Deuteronomy is one of the areas that God warned the people. Hey, you're coming into the promised land and, you know, the Bible tells us, teaches us that God knows everything. So he basically knows the roads they're going to take, right? He knows, he knows what they're going to do. Otherwise, he couldn't speak prophetically. How could you speak prophetically if you don't know what's going to happen? Then it's an if, right? Well, maybe this will happen. But scripturally, prophecy is fact, right, when God speaks it. Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 12, it says, Now when the Lord your God cuts you off from before the nations... This is God's warning to the people whom you go in to dispossess, and you dispossess them and dwell in the land. Take care that you are not ensnared to follow them. After they have been destroyed before you, that you do not inquire about their gods, saying, how did these nations serve their gods? How did they worship? That I might also do the same. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. For every abominable thing that the Lord hates, they have done for their gods. For they even burn their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods. So I would say probably in the same place, the Valley of the Son of Hinnom, was the same place the Canaanites had had their sacrifices. And later on in history, the same place where King Manasseh is going to offer his children. And the same place prior to Josiah that they're going to sacrifice their children because they're going to follow that example. In Psalm 106, verse 37, it says, They sacrificed their sons 
and their daughters to demons. They poured out innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted. This is God saying, you want to know why I dispossess the Canaanites? I dispossess, I threw them out of the land that, that it's all God's, right? So God gets to decide who goes where. God says, I threw them out of the land because the land was polluted by innocent blood. They were sacrificing, their sacrifices polluted the land. So it had to be purged. So Israel comes in. Now the Lord warns them, hey, don't do what they did. And what did they do? They did what they did. One of the things that this whole uh, COVID thing has taught me, or reminded me, hasn't taught me, this is something we all know, it has taught me the reality that there really is no limit to the depravity of man. If man can make a buck off of your um, sacrifice, right, man will make a buck off it. it. Nobody's doing anybody any favors. The people clamoring for vaccines are the same guys going to get a check if you take a vaccine, right? That's like, whoa, I, I don't know. If I like that. The depravity of man, and that's something that's pictured. We go back to Daniel, okay? Daniel prophesies concerning the coming of the Lord. And, and a lot of people focus on Daniel for uh, understanding, you know, the time when Messiah would come and, and all of that. But my focus is a little different. When I look at, at Daniel chapter 2 and we see Daniel's vision of the kingdoms of men. He describes kingdoms of men two ways. Once as a statue, another time as beasts, right? And the one thing that they all have in common is they don't stay. Why? Because the depravity of man knows no bounds. Man will burn man, will burn man, will burn man until he burns it down. And then a revolution or rebellion takes place and we start the same cycle again. The Canaanites were just like the, the, the Israelis, were just like you and I. Whatever their guilt was, ours is greater. Right? Is there innocent blood polluting our land? For sure, right? Absolutely. And uh, taxpayer money pays for it all. So, hey, hallelujah. So we have the same, we have, we're, we're, we're just as guilty at least. So Jeremiah grabs this jar of clay. He gathers those who will come with him. <laughs> People didn't like Jeremiah. If Jeremiah came to your house and said, hey, you want to come out? I'd, I'd like to talk to you. Most people would be like, ah, I'm busy. I got something else to do. You never have anything good to say. You know, you're going to bust my chops. I don't know that I want to hear what you have to say. So he gathers. That's why the Lord says, get some of the elders, some of the elders or the priests. You know, you're not going to get them all. Nobody, everybody doesn't want to hear. Same thing happens if, if you were to stand on the street corner and, and share the gospel, right? Do people want to, you ever have friends who don't want to hear you talk about Jesus? We can get together, but let's give Jesus a rest, right? Let's, let's talk about something else. Let's not, let's not delve into that part. So he says, I want you to gather them together, and I want you to tell them, give them the word of the Lord. So he does that. <clears throat> so he's going to deliver a message. Now, here's what I want you to understand. This is where the idea of the wrath of God, the judgment of God all comes together. Deuteronomy chapter 28, we're going to go look at that together. Um, it wasn't in my notes, so it won't be on the slide, but uh, I'm sure you guys can find it. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, book number five. Dang, you're good. Well, don't worry, there's other ones. <laughs> so I'm going to start at Deuteronomy 28, verse 1. I'm going to read the whole thing because I want you to hear what God said to the children of Israel before you go to the land where the Canaanites have done these things, right? They've worshipped other gods, they've rebelled against me, they've slaughtered the innocent, I'm going to judge them, you're going to go in and dispossess them, what's going to happen to Israel hundreds of years later? God's going to send the Babylonians to the Israelites to do what? Dispossess them, why? Because they're worshipping other gods, because they're the sacrificing the blood of the innocent. The same, they're guilty of the same stuff, right? So he's going to go in and he's going to dispossess them. And I want us to understand that that the wrath of God and the judgment of God is a predisposed um, position that God is stating, if you walk this road, when you get to the end, this is what's going to happen. You guys with me? 
And then we're going to look back at Jeremiah 19, and you're going to see the exact same words. So that's fair warning. If, we, if you were say, Jackie, how do I get to your house? And I give you directions, and you choose not to take them. You get lost, drive off a cliff, and perish. That's on you. Right? I told you how to get there. If I say, hey, come here and make a left, and you'll get to my house, make a right, and you're going to you know, fall off a cliff, so don't do that. And you say, well, it won't happen to me. And I say, oh, no, there's been other people before you try to come to my house, but they keep making a right. I don't know why. In fact, I got a sign out there that says, no right, turn. But as soon as they see the sign, no right, turn, what do they want to do? Oh, that can't be for me. And so, see, man keeps doing the same stuff over and over again. Let's look at Deuteronomy uh, chapter 28, and we'll, um, we'll hopefully... And we'll, we'll just uh, read that together. If you, if you want to follow along with me, Deuteronomy 28, we'll pick it up in verse 1. There's 68 verses, so it's going to take me a minute. And if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall be the city... Blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of the ground and the fruit of your cattle and the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. Blessed shall be the basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before you and they will come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing on you and your barns and in all that you undertake and he will bless you in the Lord that the Lord your God is giving you. The Lord will establish you as a people holy unto himself as he has sworn to you if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his way. And all the peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord and they shall be afraid of you. And the Lord will make you abound in prosperity and the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your livestock <clears throat> Excuse me, in the fruit of your ground, within the land that the Lord swore to give your fathers to give you. <clears throat> the Lord will open to you his good treasury, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season, to bless all the work of your hands, and you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And the Lord will make you the head, not the tail, and you shall only go up and not down. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and be careful to do them, and if you do not turn aside uh, from any of the words that I command you today, to the right or to the left, to go after other gods or to serve them. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God, or be careful to do <clears throat> all his commandments, his statutes that I command you today, and all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the field. Cursed shall be the baskets in your kneading bowl. Cursed will be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of the ground, the increase of your herds and your young flocks. Cursed shall you be when you come in. Cursed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will send on you curses, confusion, frustration, and all that you undertake to do until you are destroyed and perish quickly on account of the evil of your deeds because you have forsaken me. The Lord will make the pestilence stick to you until he has consumed you off the land that you are entering to take possession of. The Lord will strike you with wasting disease, with fever, inflammation, fiery heat, and with drought, and with blight and mildew. They will pursue you until you perish, and the heavens over your head shall be bronze, and the earth under you shall be iron. And the Lord will make the rain in your land powder. From heaven dust shall come down on you until you are destroyed. The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them. You will be a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth. Your dead body will be food for all the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and there will be no one to frighten them away. The Lord will strike you with boils of Egypt, with tumors and scabs uh, and itch, of which you cannot be healed. The Lord will strike you with madness and blindness and confusion of mind, and you will grope at noonday 
as blind grope in darkness, and you shall not prosper in your ways. You shall be only oppressed and robbed continually, and there will be no one to help you. You shall betroth the wife, but another man will ravish her. You shall build a house, but you shall not dwell in it. You shall plant a vineyard, but you will not enjoy its fruit. Your ox will be slaughtered before your eyes. You shall not eat any of it. Your donkey will be seized before your face, but shall not be restored to you. Your sheep shall be given to your enemies, but there shall be no one to help you. Your sons and your daughters shall be given to other people, while your eyes look on and fail with longing for them all day long. And you will be helpless. A nation that you have not known will eat the fruit of your ground and of all your labors, and you will be only oppressed and crushed continually, so that you are driven mad by the sights that your eyes will see. The Lord will strike you on the knees and on the legs with grievous boils of which you cannot be healed from the sole of your foot to the crown of your head. The Lord will bring you, your king whom you set over you, to a nation that neither you nor your fathers have known, and they shall serve other gods of wood and stone. And you will become a whore, a proverb, a byword among all the peoples where the Lord will lead you away. You shall carry much seed into the field. And, and shall gather in little, little, for the locusts shall consume it. You shall plant vineyards and dress them. You shall neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes, for the worm shall eat them. You shall have olive trees throughout all your territory, but you will not anoint yourself with the oil, for the olives will drop off. You shall father sons and daughters, but they will not be yours, for they will go into captivity. The cricket shall possess all your trees and the fruit of the ground. The sojourner who is among you will rise higher and higher above you, and you shall come down lower and lower. He shall lend to you, and you shall not lend to him. He shall be the head, and you shall be the tail. All these curses will come upon you and pursue you and overtake you till you are destroyed because you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and statutes that he commanded you. And they will be a sign and a wonder against you and your offspring forever because you did not serve the Lord your God with joyfulness and gladness of heart because of the abundance of all things. Therefore, you will serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger and thirst and nakedness and lacking everything. And he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. The Lord will bring a nation against you from far away from the ends of the earth, swooping down like an eagle. A nation whose language you don't understand, a hard-faced nation who shall not respect the old or show mercy to the young. It shall eat the offspring of your cattle and the fruit of your ground until you are destroyed. It also shall not leave you grain or wine or oil, the increase of your herds or the young of your flock until they have caused you to perish. They shall besiege you in all your towns till your high and fortified walls in which you trusted come down throughout your land. They will besiege you in all your towns throughout all your land which the Lord your God has given you. And you shall eat the fruit of your womb, the flesh of your sons and daughters whom the Lord your God has given you in the siege and in the distress with which your enemies shall distress you. The man who is the most tender and refined among you will begrudge food to his brother, to the wife he embraces, to the last of the children children whom he has left. So that he will not give to any of them any of the flesh of his children whom he is eating. Because he has nothing else left in the siege and in the distress with which your enemy will distress you in your towns. The most tender and refined woman among you who would not venture to set the sole of her foot on the ground because she's so delicate and tender. Will be grudged to the husband she embraces, to her son, to her daughter, her afterbirth that comes out from between her feet and her children whom she bears because lacking everything she will eat them secretly in the siege and in the distress with which your enemy will distress you in the towns if you are not careful to do all the words of this law which are written in this book that you may fear this glorious and awesome name the Lord your God then the Lord will bring on you and your offspring extraordinary afflictions afflictions severe and lasting sicknesses Grievous and lasting, he will bring upon you again all the diseases of Egypt, of which you were afraid, and they will cling to you. Every sickness also, every affliction that is not recorded in the book of the law, the Lord will bring upon you until you are destroyed. 
Whereas you were as numerous as the stars of the heaven, you will be left few in number because you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God. And as the Lord took delight in doing you good and multiplying you, so the Lord will take delight in bringing ruin upon you and destroying you. And you will be plucked off from a land that you are entering to take possession of it. The Lord will scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth to the other. And there you shall serve other gods of wood and stone, which neither you nor your fathers have known. And among these nations you will find no respite, for there shall be no, no resting place for the sole of your foot. But the Lord will give you their trembling heart and failing eyes and a languishing soul. Your life shall hang in doubt before you night and day. You shall be in dread and have no assurance of your life. In the morning, you shall say, if only it were evening. And at evening, you will say, if only it was morning. Because of the dread that your heart will fill. And the sights that your eyes will see. And the Lord will bring you back in ships to Egypt. A journey that I promise you should never make again. And there you shall offer yourselves for sale to your enemies. As male and female slaves. But there will be no buyer. Now, keep in mind, as the Lord is laying this out, Moses is telling the people, they haven't even entered into the land yet. So I have just described for you two paths, right? In fact, Deuteronomy is going to say, you know, I have set before you two paths. In fact, Deuteronomy 30, 19, it, the Lord says, I have called heaven and earth to witness to you, against you today. I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, what's it, how's it go? Choose life. So the Lord just said before you, here's where this road goes, here's where this road goes. This road over here, the most delicate of you are going to eat your own children and deny your own family members to share with with them. Oh, Here's what people say. I would never do that. No. You'll do worse. The depravity of man knows no bounds. If you think you can't do it, you just are missing the opportunity and the circumstance to do it. That's it. The Lord says if you take this path, life, blessing, right? That has, in fact, that's how he started. Go left, blessing. Everything's good. Just take the left turn. Go right, it's bad. Don't do that. I have set before you the choice. You have the opportunity to choose, right? But if you choose right... God is it's not a flash of anger. The Lord says, you get to the end of that road, this is what's there. This is what's there. Don't look at me and say, Lord, why? What do you mean, why? I told you it was on this road. You took it. You drove here. You find yourself in this position. So we need to understand that. So back in Jeremiah, <clears throat> verse 3, this is what the Lord says. You shall say, hear the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah. Now, the kings aren't there, right? No, he's, he's going to deliver this message to the temple in a moment. You shall say, hear the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Behold, I am bringing such disaster upon this place that the ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. The news is so bad and so shocking that it's going to ring in their ears. Yeah, it's weird because you hang around Buell at night, there's explosions. You guys hear them things? Is it just me? I like go look out my window expecting to see a bunch of dudes running down the street shooting at people. It's crazy. It's weird. What's going on? I don't know. But anyway, the point is this word that Jeremiah brings is so shocking it's going to make their ears ring. What did he just say? He said that you've come to the end of the road. Judgment day has come. Oh, we'll change tomorrow. No, it's too late. There's no change. That was Jeremiah 18, right? Repent, you're still soft. God can form you into whatever he wants. Now you're finished. Now you're fired. Now you're hard. What happens to the hard clay? It gets broke. It gets thrown away. Their ears will tangle. Why? Verse 4. Because the people have forsaken me. This is where he starts. Number one, the people have forsaken the Lord. That means simply they've turned their back on God. So it's like God is saying to them all along that journey, don't lose sight of this, all along the journey when they come to the crossroads and they turn right. 
<clears throat> all along the way, God is saying, stop, 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 turn around, repent, change. What, what's going on? God is calling. God is wooing. They have turned their back to him. You ever had a conversation with one of your kids and have them turn their back on you? What's next? Oh, something happens, right? I don't know what you guys do, but in my family, uh, my dad had good ways of turning me around. And none of them had anything to do with choice. Yeah, he just, he, 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 you don't turn your back. Is that rude? If you're having a conversation with somebody you're doing work for or somebody who's working for you and they turn their back on you, what do you how do you respond to that? That is what it is to forsake the Lord. When God says, stop, turn around, repent, and you say, nah, what's the big deal? You turn your back on the Lord. That's forsaking him. You have forsaken the Lord next and have profaned this place by making <clears throat> offerings to other gods. So God said, I'm going to bring you into the land. I'm going to give you victory. I'm going to bring you here. Now don't turn your back on me and start serving the gods of the people who were here before you. Don't, don't make the same mistakes. What, what do we learn from history? What does man do? How come the Roman Empire is not still here? How do I know that the United States of America will not be eternal? Because there's been no kingdom before them who has been. Why? Because man does the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. What is history? The study of the same mistakes made over and over and over and over again. Right? Is it any different? Does, is there somebody out there with the right answers? Here's what I know. The more news I watch, the more I understand. Nobody knows what the heck they're doing. Nobody knows what's going on. <clears throat> Nobody knows how it's going to go. Basically, everybody's going to throw out all these ideas, and when it happens, they're going to look back and say, this guy was the closest. But nobody knows what's going on. Nobody knows what's happening. You have doctors coming on YouTube saying, you shouldn't shelter in place. You're lowering your immunity. That's a doctor. That's not me. What, what was the response? How did YouTube and Google, how did they respond? They took it off. Because it's not the right narrative. I don't know. I ain't a doctor. I'm not pretending to be a doctor. I'm just saying it's interesting what we're watching happening, right? Nobody knows what's going on, what they're doing, how things are supposed to work. One side says you should wear a mask. The other side says, nope, you shouldn't wear a mask. And they're both doctors. Who do you listen to? The doctor you like best? The one who's prettiest? Has all his teeth? I don't know. What's the rule? What's the rule? Here's what I know. All men are depraved. All men, they will sell you out for a buck. History hasn't shown that. History has shown that. What delivers us from that mindset? What delivers us from that depravity? The surrendering to Jesus Christ does. Because now I have someone to follow who won't sell you out for a buck, right? Now I'm following somebody who would sacrifice himself for you. Isn't that the example, right? We want to we wanna follow that example, right? That's Jesus says, I'll change you. Ezekiel said, God will give you a heart of flesh to replace the heart of stone, right? God will do that work, but it requires us to submit to him. So when we come to the crossroads, you go the way God says, right? God says, go left, what do you do? Go left. I don't care what left is. God says, go right. I go right. I don't care what right is. It doesn't matter. If, God, if it's what God's word is saying, that's the final arbiter. We go there and we say, okay, I'm going to do it. We're not going to forsake the Lord. We're not going to profane the land by worshiping other gods. We're going to come before the Lord. We want to follow him. Why? Because they have filled this place with the blood of the innocents. The United States of America is guilty of the blood of hundreds of million innocents. And I'm not just talking about abortion. The United States of America is guilty of the blood of innocent. For sure. So, if Israel was guilty, we're guilty. Are we on the road that God is calling us to, or are we on the road of rebellion? When you look at our nation, what road are we on? 
you should know we're on the road of rebellion. Nobody's saying, hey, we need to get back to what the Lord says. We need to start being obedient to the word of God. No, nobody's saying that, right? They're saying, throw that stuff out. What's wrong with you people? Get rid of all that. That's the road you're on. If I'm honest, 2020, I don't care who you vote for. If something doesn't change in our nation, we are headed to judgment. There will be a day where the things God said about Israel will be true about us. Not because God's finally had enough of us, he's going to zap us, but because God said, if you go down that road, that's what's down that road. Do you know what's down that road? That's why he gives us the history here, so we can go, look what's down that road. I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. So what does he tell us to do? Well, teach these things to your children. When you're lying down, when you're walking in the way, when you rise up, when you go to bed, teach these things. Right? I, I can't, maybe I can't, maybe I can, but I don't, know. We, I don't know if I can change the course of the nation, but I can change the course of the people I'm in contact with. Right? Just like Jeremiah, don't go that way. Turn around. We got to change our direction. Look at verse 5. They had built the high places of Baal. <laughs> the word Baal means Lord. It was a common title used for a variety of gods in the, uh, in, in the ancient Near East. So, so there's often a lot of confusion. W- what Baal? There's lots of Baals, but basically the idea is you're worshiping false gods, right? You're going before things that aren't Yahweh. This is not the God who delivered you out of Egypt. Thank the children of Israel. Remember the picture. We've come to Mount Sinai. God is on top of the mountain speaking. There's thunder and lightning and clouds. And God's voice speaks the Ten Commandments. And then the people go to Moses. Moses, make them be quiet. So stop, stop, stop. Moses, you go talk to them. Well, I can't, we can't handle this. So Moses says, okay, I'll go talk to them. So Moses goes up where he's gone how long? 40 days, right? Moses goes to talk to God. Eventually, God says to Moses, hey, Mo, you need, you need to get back down there. Why do you got to get back down? Why, Lord, I'm, this is awesome. I want to stay up here. No. They just built a golden calf, and they're celebrating the golden calf that took them out of Egypt. In the shadow of a mountain covered with thunder and lightning and the voice of God. It doesn't matter that you think you can prove God exists to man because Romans chapter 1 says man don't care. God has made it clear man don't care in his rebellion. In the shadow of God he will build a golden calf and bow down and worship it. That's the depravity of man. That's the sinfulness. That's the rebellion of man. So the Lord is saying, look, you did these things, verse 5, which I did not command or decree, nor did it come into my mind. I never even, I never even thought about uh, this, these things that you would do. And we say, well, you did think about it, Lord. Genesis 22, you told Abraham to offer up his son, right? Yeah, God stopped him, right? Who's the only father who would ever offer his son as a sacrifice? God would offer his son. For who? Us. There's no son of ours he wants. It won't do any good. It was only the sinless perfection of the Lord God. In 2 Kings 21.16, it says, Moreover, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to the other. That's a lot of blood, right? From one end to the other, besides the sin he made, Judah to sin so that they did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So Manasseh filled the land with innocent blood. We know Manasseh sacrificed his own children when he built his palace, and he taught other people to sacrifice theirs. And listen, you just heard, well, a while back ago, I don't remember what it was, Golden Globes or whatever, when Ricky Gervais roasted all of Hollywood, if you if you vaguely remember. <clears throat> um, he called out Apple. Why? Because Apple talks about how progressive they are while they make their stuff in sweatshops that pay kids a quarter a day. Depravity of man. Are they guilty of innocent blood? Does that cost people's lives? For sure. For sure. It ain't just one thing, man. 
Mankind is destructive. He is a destructive animal. Apart from submitting himself to the Lord Almighty, man will destroy man. That's what we have done best. Look at our history. 10,000 years of human history. You look. We ever not go to war? We ever not kill our neighbor? The only one who showed us that way was Jesus Christ. A lot of people have tried to, to imitate it. A lot of people have come close, but he's it. He's it. Nobody else was saying those things. Jesus is. 2 Kings 24.4 <clears throat> says, And also for the innocent blood that he shed, he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood that the Lord would not pardon. Right? So not just the 60 million abortions a year. Uh, we, we sent Hillary Clinton around the world teaching other nations how to offer abortions to their people too. We're the number one seller of the sacrifice of the innocent. That's what we do. While we're proclaiming our great history, let us not ignore our great sin. We're guilty. We stand guilty before the Lord. So what's the consequence? Look at verse 6. Therefore, behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when this place shall no longer be called Topheth. Topheth means oven, stove, right? That's how they sacrifice their children. They put them on the fire. <coughs> or the valley of the son of Hinnom, it'll be called the valley of slaughter. So what's God saying he's going to do? In this place, I will make void the plans of Judah and Jerusalem. So I'm going to change the name of this valley. They're going to call it the valley of slaughter instead of the oven where they, where they cook their kids. And I'm going to make all their counsel come to nothing. So the more they try, the less they can solve. They're going to make plans, but they're not going to be able to solve anything. He says, I will cause their people to fall by the sword before their enemies, by the hand of those who seek their life. I will give dead bodies for food of the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. That doesn't sound like Deuteronomy 28. Hundreds of years before this, God said, don't take this road. This is where it ends. Now God's saying, you've come to the dead end. This is the day. This is the day. He says, everyone who passes by will be horrified and hissed because of the wounds. And I will make them eat the flesh of their sons and daughters. What are they going to do in the siege? They're going to eat their children and argue over whose kid they eat next. People that God said, you'll never believe these people would do such a thing. But they're going to do it. Because this is what the heart of man is. And if we don't get to the place where we can acknowledge that, our sinfulness before a holy God, what hope do we have? We pretend we would never do that. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. But I'm always blown away by the, by the horrible things man will do to man. There's, there's no shortage of war crimes to study, is there? I will make them eat that flesh, and everyone will eat the flesh of his neighbor in the siege and in the distress with which the enemies <clears throat> and those who seek their life will afflict them. Deuteronomy 28, 25 said, The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies, and you will go out one way and flee seven, and your body will be food for birds. Same thing now God's saying in Jeremiah. The, the very thing I told you was going to be the curse, if you go the wrong way, you've got there. You arrived at the destination you didn't want to arrive at. In Deuteronomy 28, 53 to 57, the Lord said, you're going to eat your own children. If you go that way, you're going to eat your own children. And now they've arrived at the place where they're doing what? They're going to eat their own children. So then the Lord says in Jeremiah 19, 10, then you will break the flask in the sight of the men who go with you and shall say to them, thus says the Lord of God, so I break this people, this city, as one breaks a potter's vessel so that it can never be mended. So he takes the jar of clay and he smashes it on the ground. That's what God's about to do. God's going to smash this place. And ultimately that's exactly what God did. His judgment fell. Wrath came. And Israel ceased to exist and was taken as slaves to Babylon. That's just a fact of history. That God told them would happen hundreds of years before it came. Is there anything in the Bible God's told us about future events that haven't yet happened? 
and do they sound like judgment? And why does that judgment come? The story is not new. This is a story the Lord's been telling since the history of men. <laughs> so I will break this people as one breaks the potter's vessel and it will not be mended. Men shall bury in Topheth because there's no other place to bury. Then I will go to this place, declares the Lord, to its inhabitants, making this city like Topheth. The houses of Jerusalem, the houses of the kings, all the houses on whose roofs offerings have been made to the hosts of heaven, worshiping the stars, worshiping the heavens, right, the planets, uh, angels. And drink offerings have been offered to other gods. They will be defiled like the place of Topheth. So every place you've done this stuff, where you've sacrificed your children, where you've worshipped other gods, all those places I'm going to bring down. God's, it's what he, this is part of God's judgment. It's matter of fact. You turned right. That's where that road goes. All along the road, God said, turn around, turn around, turn around, turn around. Prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet. Turn around, turn around, turn around. How many preachers are saying turn around today? I'd say there's a fair amount. How many people are calling for repentance? I'd say there's a fair amount. Why? Because that's what the Word of God calls us to do. Repent. Repent. Turn. Lift your eyes to heaven. That's where our help comes from. Put your hope in Christ. He's our deliverer. He's the one who will save. He's the one who will deliver us. Then it says, verse 14, Jeremiah came from Topheth where the Lord had sent him to prophesy. And he stood in the court of the Lord's house. So he took the people who would come with him. So I'm guessing the people who would come with him out there for this little illustration is maybe a handful. Right? Who's going to go? Jeremiah says, hey, I got a word from the Lord. Yeah, we've heard it before. But I'm sure a few people went, right? A couple of the elders went from here, a couple of the elders from there. But then where did Jeremiah go? He went where the people are. He went to the court of the temple. There's people everywhere there. There's idols of various gods set up throughout the court of the temple. They were worshiping a variety of gods. They were very open and welcoming other, other forms of worship there at the temple. Yahweh is there too, so you can worship Yahweh, but you can also get you know, a quick prayer into Baal or Ashtoreth or Molech. You can, you can cover all your bases. We have a one-stop one shop for worship. The people are all gathered there. He goes to the court of the Lord's house, and he said to all the people, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing upon this city and upon all its towns all the disaster that I have pronounced against it because they have stiffened their neck, refusing to hear. So all the while, Jeremiah 18, remember the, pre, the chapter right before this, God said the potter found something wrong in the clay so he could address it, right? He addressed what was wrong with the clay. He could make the clay. He could, he could fix it. There was opportunity. The clay was malleable. All along the path from Jeremiah 18 to 19, God's calling for repentance. Jeremiah 19, the Lord says, it's, it's judgment day is here. It's here. The judgment of the Lord will be poured out. It will come. Why? <laughs> refusal to submit. A refusal to humble oneself. A hardening of our heart and a stiffening of our neck. We often struggle, mankind often struggles with, why, God, why do you allow this? Why, why is this happening? I put out a couple of videos on YouTube during this time to try to express some of those ideas, you know, and I've shared up, up here a number of times, look, you and I don't know what's good and what's bad. We just assume if it hurts, it's bad. Is that always true? Sometimes when a doctor is providing healing, does it cause pain? Yeah, sometimes. Does that bring about something good? Yeah. So therefore, is pain always bad? No. Then is suffering always bad? No. Do we know for certain all this, all the things we think are, are wicked and abominable? Do we know for sure they're wicked and abominable? No. Who knows? God does. So we humble ourselves and we trust the, that the Lord knows. So if the Lord brings me through a storm, if I have to sit in a bed next to my mom who hasn't known me for four years and still doesn't know me, who am I to look at God, shake my fist at him and say, what have you done this? He's the potter. 
I'm the clay. You, you mold and make me, Lord, however you see fit. You're king. I'm not. I trust you. I don't understand it. I don't have an answer. I just choose to trust him. I choose to acknowledge I don't know everything. Do you know everything? <clears throat> I've, I've heard some people who think they know everything, but I'm pretty sure none of them really do. So I'm going to put my trust in the Lord. And God sees fit, you know, to, to take my mom home. I'm going to celebrate for my mom. My mom's okay. I'm going to be sorrowful for me. I'm sorry for the years I lost. I'm sorry for the time I wasted, right? All the regret that all of us have anytime we lose anybody. That's real, right? Yeah. But who am I to say it was bad? Who am I to say God was wrong for what he did? There are events in my life that were horrific that I don't even talk about. But I don't shake my fist at God and say, why did, the, you, why did you let this happen, God? I choose to trust God. God, you know what you're doing. I don't know. I, don't, I can't connect the dots. I don't have to. I know in whom I have believed and I'm persuaded he's able to keep me. I have put my, I've die, I cast my die. I'm with the Lord. I'm on his side. Wherever you take me, good, bad, ugly, if I starve to death, if I get sick, if I get cancer, if I get run over by a truck, I don't care. God's right in whatever he does, and I trust him. I, I don't have answers. Neither did Job. Read it. God didn't give him no answers. God just said, where were you, Job, when I made the earth? Yeah, you weren't there, were you? Maybe I know more than you. What did Job say? He did the smartest thing ever. He said, when the Lord came to him and Job said, I don't have nothing to say, God. You're in charge. That's what the clay says to the potter, right? <clears throat> the time of judgment comes, but here's what I want you to understand. <clears throat> We're in Jeremiah 19. And the, this word of judgment, the judgment did fall. These, these things did happen to these people. Many people perished. Many people died. Many people were taken into slavery. But there's still a chapter called Jeremiah 31. You, you know what happens there? God says, there's a day coming where I'll make a new covenant with you. Not like the old one which your fathers broke and you guys all screwed up. It's not going to be like that. In the new covenant, I'm going to save you. Because you can't save yourself. Has the Lord provided that way? Do we find ourselves under the new covenant today? Where we can call upon the name of the Lord and he says, I will deliver you? Did it mean I'm not depraved? Does it mean I don't have bad thoughts? Does it mean I don't do dumb stuff? No, I try not to. Right? I try to follow the example the Lord le leaves for us. But he covers me. He justifies me by the perfect blood of Jesus Christ. So we look at this and we recognize the jar is broken and there's no remaking the jar. The nation of Israel perishes, but it never comes back. It's never been what it was. Today, still not what it was. It has never been what it was. That jar is broke. That jar is gone. It's irrevocable. It's past, but... Is the future broken? Nope. Is Messiah still coming? Yeah. Will he deliver his people? He will. Will he deliver you? Yeah. Will he deliver you even in all the craziness we got going on? Yep. Will he deliver you even though all the people that you're talking to won't listen to you? Uh-huh. That's the next chapter. See, Jeremiah, he's doing all these faithful things and telling people, stop, turn around, judgment's coming, stop, turn around, judgment's coming, and the people get mad at him. They declare him guilty of hate crimes. They throw him in prison. But he's still God's kid. And he's not finished. Jeremiah is going to serve the Lord for 40 years. 40 years calling the people, turn around talking to the people. He'd walk into a living room while they're eating their child and he would say, stop doing this and just walk across and give yourself as a slave and live. Left, right. Life, death. What did Moses say? The Lord said, I set before you life and death. Choose life. 
Choose life. Same truth for us today. Amen? Choose life. Let's stand before the Lord. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity that we can study your word, God, that we can look <clears throat> into this incredible book of Jeremiah, be challenged, Lord, by the things you call us to, Lord, the, uh, the incredible parallels. We are a guilty land, God. We have slaughtered innocent. We have slaughtered our own. We have slaughtered others. We take advantage of people. We've all in the name of uh, making a buck. I don't know, God. I, I don't even know all the horrible things our nation has done to others. I don't even know. I know the horrible things I've done. So, Lord, uh, God, I just pray that we would just realize, Lord, all of these things that we're going through now, we're, we're not in the tribulation. We are this, not the mark of the beast, not coming tomorrow. This, all the crazy things that people got going on. This is what Jesus declared as labor pains. This is God's prophets and God's voice saying, your road leads to destruction. Will you turn? Your road leads to destruction. Will you stop? Will you change your direction? Will, or will you <clears throat> harden your heart, stiffen your neck, and pull to kick against the goats? Well, the Lord said to Paul, isn't it hard to kick against the goats? What are you doing, brother? And you know, that day Paul said, yeah, I'm an, I'm an idiot. I've been slaughtering people and killing the innocent, and I'm wrong. So that day, Paul, at the time, his name was Saul, he humbled himself before the Lord, just like the story Jesus told of the tax collector. He humbled himself before the Lord, he fell on the ground before God, and he beat his breast, and he said, have mercy on me, a sinner. And he went from that place justified. The blood of Jesus Christ washed him clean and the rest of his life was calling people to turn from their rebellion and turn toward the Lord. And that voice has been going out through the church, through, through all of history. Mankind, still, there are faithful men standing in pulpits around the, this nation and around the world calling people to repent. Repent and believe. Lay down your sin. Submit yourself to the potter. Be malleable clay. Allow him to make and mold you as he sees fit. Trust him. And allow God to deliver you. For he is able to do abundantly above all we can ask or imagine according to the power that works within us. So may we trust you and as we go, one becomes two, two becomes four, four, eight, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four. Change comes bit by bit as people say, you know what, I'm I'm not gonna do this no more. I'm turning away from the crazy, I'm turning away from those attitudes, and and I just want to do what God says. So the Lord tells me to love my enemies, do good to those who hate me. If a man asks for your your shirt, give me your cloak also. That man, there are things that Jesus calls me to that are revolutionary, and I don't even have to argue over them. They're plain. May we find ourselves in a place where we say, you know, God, I just want to walk like you. I, I just want to do what you say. I want to love my wife. I want to love my neighbor. I want to do good to those who hate me. I want to call our land to turn while the clay is still soft. Before the Lord throws the jar on the ground and says, it's judgment day. For we are guilty. So God, may we turn to you as a people, beat our breasts and say, have mercy on us. We are sinners. Guilty. But Jesus Christ can make us clean. Jesus Christ can wash away my guilt. Jesus Christ can lift me. For the Lord says, if you humble yourself before the Lord, he will exalt you. The pride 
The proud he'll bring low. The humble he will lift them up. God, may we just hear your call. May we respond. And little by little, may we see, at least in our sphere of influence, the life that Christ brings. May we see it blossom and bring forth fruit, even in the midst of all the crazy. God, be glorified and magnified because we want to honor you. We want to lift you on high. We want to put our eyes upon you, and we want to follow you. You've told us the way to go, so may we be obedient to follow you, and may you be glorified in that obedience as we look to you. And when we fail, as the Bible says, a righteous man falls seven times in a day and rises again. So when we fall, may we confess our sins and you will be faithful and just to forgive us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then we stand up and continue on until the day we see your face. And when we do, God, may we hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Be glorified in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you Lord it's your breath in our lungs so we pour So we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. praise you for being our source of, of hope, God of, of light in the darkness, God. And we just uh, pray even now, Lord, come soon. Come soon, Lord. Give us uh, the strength it takes to keep going because we're tired. We're weary, Lord. And this is just the first little bit of weirdness of, of chaos that we've seen, Lord. And we're already tired, God. We pray that you would just sustain us, Lord. Continue to give us your strength, God. Continue to draw us close to you when it seems like all we want to do is, is go further away from you, Lord. When it seems like we just want to rely on ourselves to, to fix our problems, to fix everybody else's problems, to fix the problems with the world because we always have greater ideas, God. I pray in those moments, Lord, that you would fix our eyes on you, God. That we would do what your word says and, and think upon higher things, Lord to think upon you, God, to dwell upon your greatness, Lord, your majesty. And God, we just pray, Lord, come soon and give this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, just a quick announcement for you guys also. Tomorrow is the National Day of Prayer. I guess we're going to be live streaming it on Facebook and YouTube like we do service. So, guys, tune in at 7, Kathy. 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock, tune in National Day of Prayer. Thank you, guys.